verses uh, 3 and 4, and then Luke chapter 19, uh, verses, verse 10, actually. That's the, those are the key texts. We'll see them ac- across the course of the study tonight. Luke chapter 1. Listen to how he opens this. This is written to an individual, and we'll pick this up. We're going we're to compare this with Acts in a little while. Dr. Luke, he writes some of the finest Greek in the New Testament. Only the book of Hebrews would, would uh, parallel the, the quality, the precision, the vocabulary. This is clearly an educated person writing this. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you've been taught. I'll show this to you later. The things you have been taught is in the Greek, katecheo. You hear that? You've been catechized in these things. You've been instructed in these things. Hold on to that, Luke 19, 10. And Jesus, this is at the conclusion of Jesus' time in the house of Zacchaeus. Jesus said to them, today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. What we just read together. The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And may we, may we see these verses as leading us into the discovery of the entire gospel. That Jesus, as the Son of Man, came to seek and to save the lost. Thank you. Now you may be seated. The Gospel according to Luke is one of the earliest accounts of Jesus' life, and it's actually part one of a unified two-volume work, Luke Acts. If you compare the opening lines of both of these books, it's clear that they come from the same author, and there are internal clues in the book of Acts, as well as an early tradition that identifies the author as Luke, the traveling companion and co-worker of Paul the Apostle, who we know was also a doctor. Luke opens his work with a preface telling us how and why he wrote this book. He acknowledges that there's many other fine accounts of Jesus' life out there, but he wanted to go back to the eyewitness traditions of as many early disciples as he could in order to produce what he calls an orderly account about the things that have been fulfilled among us. Now that word fulfilled shows us why Luke wrote this account. For him, the story of Jesus isn't just ancient history. He wants to show how it's the fulfillment of the long covenant story of God and Israel, and bigger than that, of the story of God in the whole world. The book's design is fairly clear. There's a long introduction that sets up the stories of John the Baptist and Jesus. Then in chapters 3 to 9, Luke presents a robust portrait of Jesus and his mission in his home region of Galilee. After that, the large midsection of the book is Jesus' long journey to Jerusalem, which leads to the story's climax, Jesus' final week in Jerusalem leading up to his death and resurrection, which then leads on into the book of Acts. In this video, we're just going to focus on the first half of Luke's gospel. The extended introduction tells in parallel the birth stories of John the Baptist and Jesus. So you have this elderly priestly couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and then this young unmarried woman, Mary and Joseph. They both receive an unlikely divine promise that they're going to have a son. Both promises are fulfilled then, as John and then Jesus are born, and both parents sing poems of celebration. Now these poetic songs, they're filled with echoes from the Old Testament psalms and prophets, showing how these children will fulfill God's ancient promises. But these poems also preview each child's role in the story to follow. So John is the prophetic messenger promised in the Torah and the prophets who's going to prepare Israel to meet their God. And Jesus, he's the messianic king promised to David, who's going to bring God's reign over Israel and God's blessing to the nations, just like he promised to Abraham. After this, Mary brings Jesus to the Jerusalem temple for his dedication, and two elderly prophets, Anna and Simeon, they see Jesus, and they recognize who he is. And Simeon sings his own song, a poem inspired by the prophet Isaiah. He says, this child is God's salvation for Israel, and he will become a light to the nations. 
So with all this anticipation, the story moves forward into the next main section, where Luke presents Jesus and his mission. He sets the stage with John's renewal movement at the Jordan River, where he's calling a new, repentant, recommitted Israel into existence through baptism. He's preparing for the arrival of God's kingdom. And then Jesus appears as the leader of this new Israel, and he's marked out by the Spirit and the voice of God from heaven. He is the beloved Son of God. After this, Luke follows with the genealogy, and it traces Jesus' origins back to David, then back to Abraham, and then all the way back to Adam from the book of Genesis. Luke's claiming here that Jesus is the messianic king of Israel who will bring God's blessing, but not only to Israel, the family of Abraham. He is here for all the sons of Adam, for all humanity. After this, Luke has strategically placed the story of Jesus going to his hometown, Nazareth, where he launches his public mission. At a synagogue gathering, Jesus stands up and he reads from the scroll of Isaiah, saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor and freedom for the prisoners, new sight for the blind, and freedom for the oppressed. Now, along with the other Gospels, Jesus is presented here, he's the messianic king bringing the good news of God's kingdom. But what Luke uniquely highlights are the social implications of Jesus' mission. So he brings freedom. The Greek word is aphesis. It literally means release, and it refers to the ancient Jewish practice of the year of Jubilee described in Leviticus 25. It's when all Israelite slaves were released, when people's debts were canceled, when land that was sold is returned back to families. It's all a symbolic reenactment of God's liberating justice and mercy. And then Jesus says that this good news of release is specifically for the poor. Now, in the Old Testament, the poor, or in Hebrew, ani, it's a much broader category than just people who don't have very much money. It refers also to people of low social status in their culture, like people with disabilities or women and children and the elderly. It also can include social outsiders, like people of other ethnic groups, or people whose poor life choices have placed them outside acceptable religious circles. And Jesus says that God's kingdom is especially good news for these people. So after this, Luke immediately puts in front of us a large block of stories, showing us what Jesus' good news for the poor looks like. It involves the healing of a bedridden sick woman, or a man who has a skin disease, or someone who's paralyzed. There are stories here also about Jesus welcoming into his community a tax collector, like Levi, who's not financially poor, but he is a social outsider. There's a story about Jesus forgiving a prostitute. Luke showing us how Jesus' kingdom brought restoration and reversal of people's whole life circumstances. He's expanding the circle of people who get invited in to discover the healing power of God's kingdom. And as Jesus' mission attracts a large following, he does something even more provocative. He forms these people into a new Israel by appointing over them the 12 disciples as leaders corresponding to the 12 tribes of Israel. And then Jesus teaches his manifesto of an upside-down kingdom, or as Luke calls it, the sermon given on the plain. He says God's love for the outsider and the poor means that his kingdom brings a reversal of all of our value systems. He is here to form a new alternative people of God who are going to respond to Jesus' invitation by practicing radical generosity, by serving the poor. People who are going to lead by serving and live by peacemaking and forgiveness. People who are deeply pious but who reject religious hypocrisy. Now, Jesus' radical kingdom vision, his claim to divine authority, it starts to generate resistance and controversy, especially from Israel's religious leaders. His outreach to questionable people, it's a threat to their religious traditions and their sense of social stability. And so they start accusing Jesus of blaspheming God, of being a drunk and mixing with sinners. And so this section culminates in a new revelation of Jesus' mission to his disciples. He says that Yes, he is the messianic king, and that he's going to assert his reign over Israel by dying in Jerusalem, by becoming the suffering servant king of Isaiah 53, who dies for the sins of Israel. And then the shocking idea, it gets explored in the next story, as Jesus goes up a mountain with three of his disciples, and he's suddenly transformed in front of them. They're enveloped in this cloud of God's presence, who announces, this is my chosen son. And then Moses and Elijah are there, the two other prophets who encountered God's presence and voice on a mountain. And Luke tells us that they're talking together about Jesus' 
exodus that he was about to fulfill in Jerusalem. Now, that Greek word exodus, it's a clear reference to the exodus story. Luke is portraying Jesus here as a new Moses who will lead his newly formed Israel into freedom and release from the tyranny of sin and evil and all of its forms, personal, spiritual, and social. And that's going to lead us into the second half of the book. But for now, that's the first half of the gospel according to Luke. The Gospel According to Luke. In the first video, we explored Luke's portrayal of John the Baptist and Jesus as the fulfillment of the story of Israel and of God's promises told in the Old Testament scriptures. We then watched Jesus launch his mission and bring the good news of God's kingdom to the poor among Israel, people of low social status and also people who are outsiders. And Jesus taught that his kingdom is upside down. It's a reversal of all of our common social values. This section culminated with Luke showing us how Jesus was a new Moses about to bring a new exodus by his death in Jerusalem. And so we come to the large center section of the book where Jesus leads his newly formed Israel on a journey to Jerusalem. This part of the book consists mainly of Jesus' teaching and parables given on the road to the various people he encounters, mainly his growing group of disciples. And in this way, Luke portrays following Jesus as a journey. It's something you do where you learn as you go along life's path. So first, Jesus invites his disciples into his mission as he sends a wave of them to go ahead of him, announcing God's kingdom. So being a disciple right from the start, it means participating in Jesus' kingdom mission, making it your own. And as Jesus' disciples come back, he then starts to give various teachings about prayer, about trusting in God's provision. It's actually in these chapters of Luke that Jesus talks more about money, possessions, and generosity than anywhere else in his teachings. If following him is truly like being on the road, it should produce this minimalist mentality, creating a freedom from possessions that allows for radical generosity. Another key theme in these chapters is Jesus' continued mission to the poor. So as he travels, he keeps forming his new Israel, and he encounters all these people who are sick or blind. He meets Samaritans who are ancient enemies of the Jewish people. And famously, Zacchaeus, a Jewish man, but who heads up tax collection for the Romans. All of these social outsiders meet Jesus, and they're transformed by the encounter. And so they join his kingdom community, which Jesus describes as a great banquet party. He is here to seek and save the lost, and so he's celebrating when people discover the mercy of God. But not everybody at the party is happy. Luke includes multiple stories of Jesus at banquets with Israel's leaders, and these all become heated debates where Jesus confronts their pride and hypocrisy. And so these contrasting banquet parties. They're captured most memorably in Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. So a father had two sons, and one foolishly ran away and squandered his inheritance. But he comes back eventually repentant, and his father forgives him, and he throws this huge party to celebrate my son who was lost but now is found. But the older brother, who never left his father, he's angry, and he resents his father's generosity to this undeserving son. Now, in this famous parable, Jesus is explaining his whole kingdom mission to these leaders. His parties represent God's joyous welcome of every kind of person into his family. The only entry requirement is humility and repentance. And so it highlights the tragedy of Israel's leaders who reject Jesus and his upside-down kingdom community. And this resistance to Jesus, it ramps up, and he finally arrives in Jerusalem for Passover. As he nears the city, he's weeping. His disciples are hailing him as the Messianic king, but Israel's leaders are denouncing him. And he knows that their rejection of his kingdom of peace is going to set Israel on a road of resistance and rebellion against the Roman Empire it will bring the city's downfall. And it's that destruction of Jerusalem that Jesus symbolically enacts. As he storms into the temple and he runs out the animal cellars, he brings the sacrificial system to a halt. And he says that this place of worship has become a den of rebels and will be destroyed. Now this act, of course, generates a whole series of debates between Jesus and Israel's leaders, all leading up to Jesus' prediction that the Roman armies will one day surround this city, it will desolate it and the temple all within a generation. 
With that, Jesus retreats with his disciples to celebrate the Passover meal. It's the annual symbolic meal about Israel's liberation from slavery through the death of the Lamb. And so Jesus turns the meal's bread and wine into new symbols about this new exodus. His broken body, his shed blood, will bring liberation for Jesus' renewed Israel. After the meal, Jesus is arrested and he's examined before the Jewish leaders and then put on trial as one claiming to be king. And Luke emphasizes Jesus' innocence. Pilate, the Roman governor, he claims that Jesus is innocent three times before giving in. Even Herod, the ruler of Galilee, finds nothing to accuse Jesus of. But the leaders finally compel Pilate to have him crucified, and so he is. But even in his painful death, Jesus embodies the love and the mercy of God he taught so much about. He offers God's forgiveness to the soldiers as they crucify him. And then when one of the criminals executed alongside Jesus realizes who he actually is, he says, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus' final words are an offer of hope to a humiliated criminal. Today you will be with me in paradise. And so with this last act of generosity and kindness, Jesus dies. His body's placed in a tomb, and on the first day of the week, some of Jesus' disciples come to the tomb only to find it empty. And there are two angelic figures there telling them that Jesus is alive, that he's risen from the dead, and so they leave with their minds blown. And it's right here that Luke tells one of his most beautiful stories. Two of Jesus' disciples, they're leaving Jerusalem for a town called Emmaus, and they're heartbroken over Jesus' death. And then suddenly, Jesus is there, just walking alongside them, but they don't recognize him. He asks why they're so sad, and they go on to talk about all of their hopes, that Jesus would have been the one to redeem Israel. But now he's dead. It was all for nothing. But then later, as Jesus has a meal with these two, he breaks bread for them, just as he did at the Passover meal, and it's in that moment that they recognize him, then he disappears. Luke is telling this story to make a powerful point about following Jesus. When Jesus' disciples impose their agenda and their view of reality on Jesus, he remains invisible and unknown to them. It's only when we submit ourselves to the upside-down kingdom of Jesus that's epitomized in his broken body on the cross, offered in self-giving love, it's only then that we see and know the real Jesus. The book's concluding scene is yet another meal. As Jesus appears to his disciples and he explains to them from the Old Testament scriptures how this was all a part of God's plan, that the Messiah would become Israel's king by suffering and dying for their sins and conquering their evil with his resurrection life. And so now, as Simeon the prophet promised back in chapter 2, Jesus' kingdom will move outward from Israel. So God's forgiveness can be announced to the nations and everyone invited to follow Jesus. But, Jesus tells his disciples, wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Spirit to empower them for this new mission. And this, of course, keeps you reading right into Luke's second volume, the book of Acts. But for now, that's the gospel according to Luke. All right. I hope you're taking advantage of these things on your own watching them you can get them on youtube uh, but they also have their own site the the bible project site has them as well okay so we'll get a, we've been doing this giving a summary of luke and then we'll look into uh, sort of a something of an outline to see how the movements go and then we'll start picking apart various aspects to open it up for you uh, luke is a gentile physician uh, lucas would have been his name And he builds his gospel narrative around a historical, chronological presentation of Jesus' life. We've told you that that's not necessarily true uh, for Mark. It's it's certainly not true for John, as you're going to see that next week. It's the longest, you may not know this, because it doesn't have as many chapters. It's the longest uh, of the four gospel narratives. And it's the most comprehensive of the four. It presents Jesus Christ as the perfect man or the ideal man, which would have been very appealing to Gentiles. There was this notion of the ideal man, what an ideal man looked like. Now think about what we've done. Matthew's gospel emphasized Jesus uh, as the king. Mark's gospel, Jesus as the servant. 
Luke's gospel, Jesus as the Son of Man. You want to guess where we're going in John's gospel? As the Son of God. Okay, so this is, it's interesting how the Lord inspired these four men to write these, these profiles of Jesus. He's the perfect man who came to seek and save sinful men. So you have this, if you, if you read through the Gospel of Luke, you see this growing belief on the part of, as our video uh, emphasized, the outsiders, the outcasts. At the same time, a growing opposition from the religious leaders. Those who believe his claims are challenged to count the cost of discipleship. He has a section in there and emphasizes that. Those who oppose have a growing hostility and will not be satisfied until they have put him to death. And then the resurrection comes, uh, stupefying his opposition and causing the lost to rejoice that there is hope in the message he brought. And he commissions his disciples. Let's get a little outline going here if we can. Uh, the time frame you should know by now, we're looking at a 4 B.C. to 33 B.C. Uh, for, this, for the story that he tells. Uh, it breaks down along these lines, four, four major lines. The introduction of the Son of Man goes from chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 4, verse 13. It emphasizes the advent or the coming of Jesus. <clears throat> the location, excuse me, <clears throat> location of this is in Jerusalem. The emphasis is on saving the lost, and that's really an emphasis all the way through uh, the story. In this section, as well as the, as the next one, miracles are prominent. He, he performs these miracles, which, which are a highlight. The next section is the, is the ministry. When you move beyond the introduction of, the, of him, the ministry of the Son of Man. Chapter 4, verse 14 through chapter 9, verse 50. Uh, this focuses on activities. Uh, located in Galilee. This is his Galilean ministry. Saving the lost, the emphasis still, and miracles continue to have a prominence. There's a shift that takes place, though, when you get to chapter 9, verse 51, when there begins to be this, this hostile rejection of the Son of Man. And this carries on through chapter 19 through 27. There's, uh, there's antagonism shown toward him, open uh, questioning and hostility. Uh, there's admonition that comes from him to them and warning them. This happens in Jerusalem. So he's moved, uh, Israel, pardon me, moved from the Galilean area back into the uh, area of Israel. Teaching begins to be prominent here, as it does uh, in the last section where you have the crucifixion and the resurrection of the Son of Man. So you see the flow uh, of the story. Uh, his narrative he emphasizes at the outset, it's got a historical reliability. He has checked out the sources to give uh, to this most excellent Theophilus. Uh, Theophilus, I've told you this before, but is from Theos, God, Phileo, friendly love. Theophilus is someone, apparently a, a dignitary, who has a, a friendly uh, kindness toward Theos, toward God. And, uh, and Luke is introducing him, trying to convince him. Um, his historical accuracy means that, that this is the, the most comprehensive of the four Gospels. It's the longest, most literary, literally enticing, and presents Jesus, as I said, as the perfect man. Um, Let's look at these sections just briefly. Jesus, uh, the introduction of the Son of Man. Luke places a lot of emphasis on the ancestry, gives a genealogy, and I don't know if you've ever done that. Well, I think we did this one Christmas season where we compared the genealogies of Matthew and, uh, and Luke. Matthew traces the genealogy of, of Jesus back to Abraham. He's, he's the son of Abraham. Luke traces it back to Adam, as you heard on the video. Jesus is the Savior for the world. Uh, but so he has this, uh, you have the infancy stories of both John the Baptist uh, in terms of, of coming to his birth. Uh, Jesus records the birth announcements, the temple presentation of Jesus. Uh, he prepares for over 30 years, this 30 years of silence. And it's summarized, if you ever noticed this, in Luke uh, 
chapter 2, verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. This was his, his time of growing uh, into adulthood. The ministry of the Son of Man, when you move into the second section, uh, you have this picture painted by Luke of the authority of the Son of Man over every realm in nature. He shows authority over demons, disease, and nature itself. The effects of sin, authority over tradition, as he begins to, he appears to begin to, un, to turn on its head the traditions of the elders. His authority over all people, not just Jews but Gentiles. It's presented as a, as a prelude to his diverse ministry of preaching, healing, and discipling. Then you have the, the third movement, the third section, the rejection of the Son of Man, picking up in chapter 9, verse 51. And I told you earlier, you, there's, a, there's a crowd of the outcasts who are growing in their admiration for him and their, in their willingness to hear him and respond to him. And that grows right alongside. It seems like the more that the, that the common people, uh, the poor, as was described in our, in our video, these are the, 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 another way of thinking about the poor in Jesus' day with all the different descriptions that were given in the video is those not blessed by God. The Jews had this notion that if you, if you um, had religious standing, uh, you were blessed by God. If you had a, if you had a heritage, a lineage, you were blessed by God. If you had possessions, you were blessed by God. Everybody else, not blessed by God. And that's who the poor represent. And this, these, are the, these are the crowd that Jesus teaches, touches, and they respond very well to him. And then look at Luke 4, 14. And, and we'll look at Luke 6, 11. Well. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went out through all the surrounding countries. So there's this, there's this news going forth about this rabbi, Nazareth, who is touching and changing lives and speaking like no one's ever spoken. Luke 6, 11. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. That's the response at the same time of the religious people. And so it's in this setting that the opposition intensifies against Jesus. And so Jesus takes this last trip to Jerusalem and he teaches those who are with him, especially the 12, uh, practical uh, material on prayer, covetousness, faithfulness, repentance, humility, discipleship, evangelism, money, forgiveness, service, thankfulness, and his, his second coming and the, and the nature of the salvation he has come to, to bring to the lost. Then you have the last section, the crucifixion and resurrection of the Son of Man. This, uh, after he has made the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, uh, he encounters this really intensely hostile opposition of the priests, the Sadducees, the scribes, and he predicts and you can imagine how they responded to this. He predicts for them the, the overthrow of Jerusalem, the royal city that they're responsible to keep and maintain. And Jesus says that it's, come, it's coming down. It's going to fall into the hands of the enemy. He teaches the disciples for the last time and on, on his, the betrayal that he's going to experience uh, while he's in Gethsemane. There's, if, you, if you track what's happening, there's three religious trials and three civil trials, and they culminate in his crucifixion. Of course, he rises from the grave three days later, shattering all of the uh, attempts that the Romans made and the Jewish leaders insisted the Romans make to keep him in the tomb, uh, to, to not allow the rumors about the possibility of him rising from the grave. To, uh, to flourish. So he conquers the grave as he promised and three days later will rise again. And he appears on a number of occasions, these post-resurrection appearances before he ascends back to the Father. 
That's a little expanded snapshot of how the gospel of Luke moves. He's a, you think about the person himself, the title of this gospel account, Katalukan, uh, means according to Luke. He's a physician. And one writer I found, I thought this was interesting, said he writes with the compassion and warmth of a family doctor as he carefully documents the perfect humanity of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. We've already said this, but I wanted this, this writer went on to, to add to this. Emphasizes Jesus' ancestry, birth, early life. You can, you, when you start thinking about this, you can imagine a doctor would be interested in those things. He wants, he wants your chart. And Luke has studied this. He has, he's uh, gone out and interviewed eyewitnesses. He's collected material available. And so he gives us this sketch of the life of Jesus in a way that no other gospel writer does. The title of the gospel itself, I said, is, is Kata Lukan, according to Luke. Uh, this was added at a very early date, the manuscripts show. The Greek name Luke appears only three times in the New Testament. Let's look at those just real quickly to let you see. Uh, in Colossians 4, 14, Paul is writing to the church in Colossae. He has with him his physician, his attending physician, it says, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. You remember, Demas would, would desert him later. 2 Timothy 4, 11, one, it's one of the saddest statements by the Apostle Paul in all of his writings. Writing the second letter to Timothy, his son in the ministry. Luke alone is with me. When you go back and read the gospel sometime and, and see how he, how he writes about the folks that are with him, he commends this one, commends that one. In, in his last letter, Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's very useful for, to, minister, to me for ministry. And then uh, Philemon 24, he close, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. So, so there's, that's where you find uh, the name Luke mentioned in the New Testament. The video referenced this, and we agree that from the prologues to Luke and Acts, uh, that this is the same fellow. We'll read those prologues again with you real quickly. Luke chapter 1, 1 to 4. We didn't read verses 1 and 2 a while ago. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. So think about that a minute. He recognizes that there's, there's other writings underway compiling a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. He doesn't tell by whom at that point. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses, so he has, he's familiar with the eyewitnesses and ministers, those servants who, uh, who were given the, the message and the ministry by Jesus. It seemed good to me also having followed all things closely for some time past. If, he, if his gospel was written in the 60s, then about for 30 years, he has, he has studied the life and ministry of Jesus. It seemed to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, friend of God, if you, if you want a lover of God, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been catechized in you were and we don't know who did that we don't know if Luke is the one who's responsible for the catechizing of this man uh, but someone has been telling him the truths about the person and work of Jesus Christ then look at Acts chapter 1 verses 1 to 5 this, there's, I want you to notice the shift here there's a familiarity that has occurred perhaps a friendliness of the, in the first book O Theophilus, what's missing there? Most excellent. He's, he addresses him in a formal way, uh, showing the dignity and the regard for his title. There's this second time around, there seems to be a more of a friendly relationship. In the first book, O Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. That's, that's what Luke, that's how Luke describes his gospel account. Until the day he was taken up. So he began to do and to teach all the way to the ascension. 
That's what my first volume to you was about. After he'd given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he'd chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And so here's Luke telling Theophilus, this, what I'm giving you is, is historical accuracy. It's not myth. It's not fable. It's not fantasy. 40 days he was seen alive. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you, had, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So he's, if you know the book of Acts, he goes on to tell him about that, the commissioning passage. And then, of course, the, the event at Pentecost. From these two prologues, Luke and Acts, both books were addressed to Theophilus. Luke refers to the, his own gospel as the previous document or the former treatise. Acts picks up basically. When we get to the Acts, you're going to it's the it's the it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. That's the right way to understand that document. Style and language of both books are very similar for, for those who know uh, Greek language and grammar. We told you early on that that's some of the authorship issues are determined by the vocabulary used, the style used, the when you, when you lay Luke and Acts next to one another for, for grammar structure and vocabulary, they, they, and of course who it's addressed to, they clearly are written by the same person. There's, in some of the book of Acts, there's these we, we, and when, when Luke's, as he's writing narrative, sometimes he includes himself in that, the one writing it, and we did this and we traveled. The author was a close associate and traveling companion of Paul, and we cited the three references that Paul uses that Luke is, is with him. This note that I found I thought was interesting because all but two of Paul's associates are named in the third person. The list can be narrowed to Titus and Luke in terms of the we passages in Acts. Titus has never been seriously regarded as a possible author of Acts and Luke best fits the requirements. He was with Paul during his first Roman imprisonment. Paul referred to him as Luke, the beloved physician, in what we read in Colossians and Philemon. During the second Roman imprisonment, that's when Paul makes the sad commentary, only Luke is with me. Luke alone is with me. And so you have in this, this gospel narrative written by Dr. Luke also something of the character of the man, how he he hung with Paul in the face of profound danger. Some have wondered if Luke was a Hellenistic Jew, a uh, Jew of Greek background, but, but more likely that he was, a, he was a, a, a Gentile. If so, then he'd be the only, think about this, the only Gentile contributor to the New Testament, the only non-Jew to author a New Testament book. In Colossians 4, 10 to 14, I don't have this slide up for you, but Paul lists three fellow workers who are of the circumcision. This would be people with Jewish backgrounds who become Christians. And then he includes, includes Luke's name with two Gentiles on in that passage, Colossians 4, 12 to 14. So his, as I said, his, his language he uses in writing makes him uh, more likely than not a Gentile, a non-Jew. As far as who he was in his background, it's just conjecture. Some, some, one writer said that it has been suggested that Luke may have been a Greek physician to a Roman family who at some point was set free and given Roman citizenship. Others have suggested perhaps he's the brother referred to in 2 Corinthians 8, 18 and 19. Let's look at that for a minute. It's Paul writing to the church in Corinth in what we call 2 Corinthians. With him we are sending the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. Not only that, but he's been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that's being ministered by us for the glory of God himself and to show our goodwill. So it's just trying to find out where, where, do we, where, do, what, where can we find out any information about him. Bottom line, Gentile doctor. He, he demonstrates in his, uh, in his gospel, 
writing ability, a knowledge, as you would expect a physician to have, a knowledge of Latin, a knowledge of Greek, and the capacity of taking Aramaic and communicating it in Greek. You see this when you're doing a serious language study of the gospel, these things show up. When you look at traditions outside the scripture, ancient traditions, the Muratorian Fragment, which is a, which is a popular document for those who study textual criticism, uh, Irenaeus, early church father, Tertullian, uh, another scholar, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Eusebius, and Jerome. When you, Jerome wrote the Latin Vulgate. When you take and look into their writings, they all support the idea of Luke as the author of both Luke and Acts. One uh, tradition, that's what it is, we don't know the histor- historical accuracy of it, says that Luke was from Syrian Antioch, remained unmarried, and died at the age of 84, lived out a long life. We know he was with Paul at the end. So Luke was not an eyewitness. We look at the date and setting of this gospel. He was not an eyewitness of the events in this gospel, but he relied on the testimony of eyewitnesses and written sources. We read that in chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. He carefully investigated. Again, you would would expect, think about this, Peter was a fisherman. You would not expect Peter to carefully investigate. That's That's not how he's put together. Luke was a medical doctor, trained in the art of investigation. So he takes that training, he carefully investigated and arranged his material and presented it to to this Theophilus. Um, Initially introducing himself to him as, or calling him most excellent or most noble. Let's let's look at how that term is used just real quickly. There's three times in the book of Acts. In Acts 23, 26, you have Claudius Lysias, to his excellency the governor Felix, greetings. So his excellency, the governor. Acts 24, 2. When he'd been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation. There's an argument going on. uh, They're troubling, being troubled by these uh, Christians. Then Acts 26, 25. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I'm speaking truth and rational words. So that's how you would have approached a, a someone of, of power, uh, a dignitary. And this most excellent Theophilus was in, at some level uh, of, of regard and dignity. He was a man of high social standing. It suggested that in, term, in, in the terms of Luke's communication with him that, that he may have taken undertaken the publishing of, this, of Luke and Acts. They would have gone out as, as two volumes. Make it available to Gentile readers. I told you a while ago, Luke translates Aramaic terms with Greek words and explains Jewish customs and geography to make his gospel more intelligible to his original Greek readership. Some have have posited that during Paul's two-year Caesarean imprisonment, not Roman imprisonment, but his imprisonment in Caesarea, Luke may have traveled in Palestine to gather information from eyewitnesses of Jesus' ministry. The date of the gospel, when you, when you date it, depends on uh, that of the book of Acts, since Luke is the first volume. If Luke was written during Paul's first imprisonment in Rome, it would be dated in the early 60s. By now you should be familiar that one of the ways we date things it's tied to the destruction, <clears throat> excuse me, destruction of the temple in Jerusalem at 70 AD, and if that's referenced or not. In all probability, the publication preceded the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and so you would, you would put the date of Luke's gospel in the 60s, in the early 60s. Well, what's the theme and the purpose of Luke? Well, he says it in his prologue. He wanted to give an orderly account, something that that a person that wasn't familiar with the life and ministry of Jesus could take what was written down and read it and consider it, an orderly account, so that you, and here's the purpose, it's the purpose clause, so that you may know the certainty, not conjecture, the certainty of those things in which you were catechized, in which you were taught. And so uh, Luke 
wanted to create an accurate, chronological, comprehensive account of the unique life of Jesus the Christ to strengthen the faith of Gentile believers and challenge those who were not yet followers of Christ to consider, take seriously the claims of him and come to faith in Christ. It is, they mentioned this on the video. It may also be that Luke, in writing this most excellent Theophilus, wanted, wanted to uh, dismiss any notion that this was a subversive movement. That's what the Jews were saying, remember? He claimed to be a king. Pilate says, shall I crucify your king? We have no king but, G but, but, uh, but Caesar. Crucify him. So notice what Luke does. He records Pilate's acknowledgement of Christ's innocence three times. Let's look at those. This occurs in Luke 23 in that, where, where Pilate is engaging the crowd. Luke 23, verse 4. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. And the banter goes back and forth. Verse 14, he said to them, you brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. And then verse 22, a third time he said, why? Because I said, crucify him. Why? What evil has he done? I found in him no guilt deserving of death. I'll therefore punish and release him. You can see where writing to a, a Gentile nobleman, a Gentile dignitary, who may have heard, perhaps he's looked into it, and has heard that this man was, he was an insurrectionist, he was trying to overthrow the Roman government, that to have Pontius Pilate, Rome's representative, over that region, say three times, I don't find him guilty of these things, would carry weight to someone in trying to get them to consider the truth claims of the gospel. And so Luke portrays Jesus as this perfect or ideal son of man who came to seek and to save that which was lost in Luke 19.10. By the way, son of man was Jesus' favorite designation of himself. When you read through the gospel accounts and you have Jesus speaking, he will use this language more often than anything else. He has come to identify with sinners. What about keys? Keys to uh, the Gospel of Luke. Well, this key term, Jesus the Son of Man, that's what we, we gave the title to the overview tonight. Key verses, we've already read them. Chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. Chapter 19, verse 10, that is a critical. The Son of Man, why did he come? The Son of Man. This is Jesus saying, came to seek and to save the lost. Definite article here. He has, he has a people in mind he intends to save. And then the key chapters we've done before. Chapter 15. If you're familiar with chapter 15 in the Gospel of Luke, there are three parables there. There's the parable of the lost sheep. Shepherd has a, a hundred sheep. He loses one. He leaves the ninety and nine behind and goes and searches until he finds that one sheep. And there's great rejoicing when he finds that one sheep. So the the sheepfold is not missing any that belong to the shepherd. A woman has coins. She loses one. She turns the house upside down, lifting furniture, sweeping everything until she finds it. She is in possession of all of her coins. Those two parables clearly teach that Jesus was serious and meant it when he said that none would be lost that he had come to redeem. It's very powerful pictures here. And then the third parable, we've looked at this from different angles through the years here. Uh, on, in the context of this, the father has two sons. There's a ripple in this parable as it's told. The sinner, the son who becomes an awful profligate and outcast, returns in repentance and is received. That's the poor. The son who didn't go off and squander his father's inheritance, he didn't go off and party uh, in debauchery, stayed right there dutifully 
uh, producing beside his father on the family plot. You find out at the end of the story, remember, that he's got a sin problem that's not as obvious as the, as the other son's sin problem. He's got the heart of a Pharisee. All these years, I've worked for you. I've never done anything near what, and it's not, if you read chapter 15, what this son of yours, he wouldn't even call him his brother, what this son of yours has done. Never have you offered to have a banquet for me to, to honor my faithfulness. Do you know what Jesus teaches in Luke 17? If you're not familiar with it, with the Gospel of Luke. In Luke 17, Jesus tells a story. Let's, go, let's, let's read it. I don't have it on the screen, but I want, you to, I want you to see this, and I want you to think about him telling this. Because he's told these three parables. The Pharisees get it, by the way. <laughs> they know when he tells the, the parable of the two sons who they are in this, in this picture. Look at chapter 17. He talks about faith in chapter 17, 5, faith, grain of a mustard seed. Then he says in verse, in verse 7, Will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping the sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink? Afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. It's interesting that he teaches that there. The son, the hard-hearted pharisaical son, is basically saying, you've never shown me appreciation for all that I've done. And Jesus refutes that notion here when he says, if you've, if you've done all that I've requested, all you've done is your duty. Why do you think that deserves a banquet? So the teaching here is, the key chapter is these, these three parables. I would encourage you to read back over them. <clears throat> uh, understand that the parable of the two sons takes a little bit of a twist because, because he is, uh, he's clearly going after uh, the father, loves his sons, willing to redeem his sons. Okay, then let's shift one more time, a couple more times. How do we see Jesus in Luke? Well, I told you, it may seem a little tricky to you when we're actually reading the narratives of the life of Jesus, but what, what, how do we, what are the lenses we put on thanks to Luke? You see in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus' humanity and compassion repeatedly stressed throughout the Gospel. We see things about Jesus in a, in a profile of him, a panoramic look of his life that we don't see in the other Gospels. His ancestry, his birth, his development. He identifies himself as the Son of Man. He identifies with the sorrow and plight of sinful men in order to carry, out, carry our sorrows and offer salvation. And in Jesus alone, this Greek idea of the ideal man, Jesus alone fulfills it. A serious study of Jesus. You can twist, his, twist the Gospels like, like Muslims do, and, you can, and, and, and all the cults, by the way, all, they want Jesus on their coattails, but they don't embrace him and grant to him all that is taught about him in the Gospels. But you come away from the Gospel of Luke. If there's anyone who would have an interest in knowing Christ and coming to Christ, when you've encountered him in Luke, you see someone ten, tender, full of compassion. There'd be no uh, reason not to come once you read how he's portrayed in Luke. Perfect, but humble and compassionate. Well, what about Luke's gospel itself, the contribution it makes to the, to the canon of Scripture? It's the longest book in the New Testament, most comprehensive and precise of the gospels. This next thing may surprise you. When you combine Luke's two documents, the Gospel of Luke and Acts, they constitute 28% of the New Testament. More than a quarter of the New Testament is comprised in these two documents. Luke, when you look at verses, is more prolific than Paul. 
When you combine Luke and, and Acts, there's 2,138 verses. Paul wrote 2,033 verses. It's hard to imagine that. You don't think, when you think, well, Paul wrote half the New Testament. But they were letters of, of varying lengths. But Luke's 24 chapters, Acts 28 chapters, comprise more verses than Paul's writings combined. And I told you earlier, just put this down as a reminder here. It's the most refined Greek in the New Testament, and only Hebrews, the epistle of the Hebrews, compares with it. When someone is in a seminary, and they want to train uh, to hone their understanding of Greek, biblical Greek, Koine Greek, they're introduced to the Gospel of John, and then the Gospel of Luke. That's what, two long documents. But when you plow through those in what we call Greek exegesis, uh, if you want to <laughs> frustrate someone, let them read Peter. Peter's Greek's rough compared to Luke. And so it's, it's, no, it's a wonderful document. And his, his gospel stands, if it were not scripture, it would stand with a, with a liter, literary richness and a beauty because of his mastery of the Greek language. It's only in Luke that we get these four beautiful hymns. They reference three of them in the video. The Magnificat of Mary. My soul magnifies the Lord. Luke alone records that. Magnificat is the first word in the Greek that, that, that's introduced as she declares her her thanksgiving to God for what he has done for her and all people through her. The, the Benedictus of Zacharias, where he blesses the Lord. And then the Gloria in Excelsis, Gloria in, in the highest of the angelic host. And then the Nunc Dimittis of Simeon. Nunc Dimittis being the first words, now depart. Now my servant, let your servant depart. In other words, when, when, when Simeon encounters the baby Jesus. He says, now I can die. <laughs> now I can die. I've seen the Lord's salvation. So, and, and Luke, uh, Luke gives us those, and nobody else does. Not surprising, as a medical doctor, he shows in his narrative a strong interest in people. He paints these portraits of Zechariah, the Good Samaritan, the Prodigal Son, the Repentant Tax Collector, uh, Zacchaeus, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. I wondered who they were. I just want to, parenthetically, we don't know. But when he broke bread at the table with them, now they said in the video they'd seen him do this at Passover. It's a possibility. But they did it at Passover, then it's two of the twelve. But perhaps it's reference to other meals he had shared together with them. And when he broke bread, the way that he prayed and offered to God, that he was unveiled before them. He gives some elevation to women, Elizabeth, Mary, Anna, Martha, Mary of Bethany, and children. He looks at the childhoods, John and Jesus. He focuses on some themes that are particularly important. Prayer, the work of the Holy Spirit, poverty and wealth, and how Jesus addresses that. Medical issues, a doctor writing on disease, praise and thanksgiving, and then life in the home, domestic life. And Luke's gospel, more than the other three, show how universal the gospel's message is for all mankind. The, the thing that the Jewish disciples had to deal with, and you pick this up if you understand what's happening in Acts 15 at the Jerusalem Council, was do you have to? to be a Jew first before you can become a Christian. Now think about that. This was a burning topic all the way into uh, the middle of Acts. And key leaders in the church are not clear on it. Luke's gospel makes clear that the Son of Man is the Savior for all kinds of men. Jews, Samaritans, Gentiles, poor, poor, 
rich, respectable, despised, publicans, religious leaders. And that's an overview of the wonder and the beauty and the marvel of this document we call the Gospel of Luke. If you have any questions or comments or observations, 